What's up, everyone? We are back for the first post-game podcast of the 2022 season. Unfortunately, we didn't get a full game. We're going to get into that and everything that happened in Memphis. Frank is with me, so let's jump straight into it. You are Locked On Bucks, your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Bucks. I'm your host, Kane Pittman. You can catch me on this show daily and also uh, my words over at ESPN and NBA Australia. And joining me, as he does basically every post-game pod, is the uh, longtime voice of this podcast and now short-term face of this podcast as well, Frank Madden. And uh, Frank, I think... Uh, we're going to do this entire podcast. <laughs> no, no, we won't. We we won't do that. We'll we'll turn off the fire alarm. But the Bucks and the Grizzlies ends after three quarters, eighty seven seventy seven. The Bucks were trailing. Then the fire alarm went off. The Bucks players started eating barbecue in Memphis, and the game was called off. This is probably the strangest preseason beginning I can remember. Yeah, didn't the NBA experiment with like a 44-minute game um, at some point in the last few years? And uh, this was the unintentional 36-minute game as uh, we only get through three quarters before they call. I mean, basically, the, it was like the scrimmage, right? Like the scrimmage, they usually just do three quarters uh, to kick off the uh, the, uh, the kind of training camp with the Bucks. So uh, once again, the Bucks only going three quarters, but certainly not um, because of any sort of design um, unless, you know, someone from the Grizzlies was, or, or maybe the Bucks, maybe the, someone from the Bucks just wanted barbecue and was just like, screw it, you know, pull, pull the, uh, pull the fire alarm. I don't know. I don't know if anybody had eyes on Chris Middleton at the time that the, uh, the fire alarm got tripped, but um, yes, I, a very strange, <laughs> very strange way to start the preseason. Um, but certainly given who was, and perhaps more importantly, who was not playing for the Bucks tonight, um, I would say three quarters felt like felt like enough. It was enough. And certainly once they went off for a few minutes, it's kind of got to the point where it's like, okay, I don't really want these guys to come back out on the floor either. They certainly wouldn't wouldn't have wanted to. And I think it's a decent point you make. There was a number of guys that were on the sidelines tonight, probably pretty bored watching this game. So I'm not ruling out the possibility that one of them uh, set off this sprinkler and set the uh, fire alarm going. Before we dive into some of the specifics of this game, because I still do think there were some interesting things, some guys that we wanted to see out on the floor. We thank everyone for making Lockdown Bucks your first listen of every single day. We did have uh, a listener of the show, but also a listener of Lockdown Packers say that he's going to have to break it to either us, Frank, or Peter Bukowski, that only one of us can be the first listen of every day. But, uh, you know, Lockdown Bucks, Lockdown Packers, whatever. You can, you can work that out. So this game... You know, fascinating because we already knew that there was going to be no Chris, no Giannis, no Bobby, no Dante, no Rodney Hood, no Sammy Ojale. And then we find out this morning that Drew Holiday uh, was pulled out of this one as well. So given that basically none of the of the main rotation players were playing, uh, let's start with the positive. Did, what was and it, it could be a player or, or anything. What stood out to you as something that you walk away from at least, you know, slightly impressed to say that? Well, let me ask you, I was listening to, to you, uh, aside from Drew, who obviously we didn't know was, was going to miss out until this morning. Did you call that starting lineup? Was that the lineup you called? I, th- I think it more or less was, right? I thought you had Wara and Thanasis as the forwards, right? So yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I want to give you some credit here, Kane. You, I think you pretty much called the, uh, and, you, and Grayson, you said as well, um, would start, which uh, we've been talking about him as a, as a potential regular season starter as well. So Kane, good job starting the season on a on a strong note. Well, we know. Um, let, me, let me just say this. It, look, we know Bud's <laughs> tendencies from this point, and you know George Hill. We know from a couple of seasons ago, and Pat. If he can help it, he likes those guys coming off the bench. So it was, it was an educated guess, but yeah, Drew really messed it up. I just needed him to play five minutes, and I would have been able to really, really feel good about that one. Yeah. Well, and I mean, you said rotation guys not playing, but I mean, Brooke Lopez. Sure. As as you also pointed out, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it really is amazing to think back. I mean, people people that, you know, followed the NBA in the, I guess, what, early 2010s um, may remember, you know, 
Brook Lopez early in his career had all those foot injuries and it was like, Oh, look at this big guy. Is he going to be able to stay healthy? You know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, knock on wood. Uh, I, I was well, listening to you and, and Justin the other night talking about, you know, who's sort of the most important guy outside of the big three. And I also would have said Brooke just because um, we, we just don't know what the Bucks under Bud look like without Brooke Lopez. I mean, we know they can play, you know, certain lineups and they may not always want to close uh, games with, uh, with Brooke Lopez, but, uh, but yeah, we, we have not seen them have to play any sort of, anything re- resembling, you know, multiple games or really with, without Brooke, um, you know, other than just sort of resting things like that. So, but anyway, um, yes, Brooke played 20 minutes tonight, um, had a couple <laughs> blocks, you know, he was Brooke Lopez. I'm not worried about Brooke. Um, I thought, I thought, I guess probably the, the two guys that um, I, I'm, I'll, I'll say three, three guys that I think merit the most discussion. I think, uh, you know, Grayson Allen, just because new guy uh ironically he was in the place that he was last year in in memphis so got to start his bucks career off um in a familiar uh place uh on his old home floor in memphis um but i thought you know he acquitted himself uh, quite well i think we can talk a little bit about grayson allen um jordan wara ended up with a very jordan wara stat line 16 points on 15 shots in 23 minutes minus 14 um but i thought there were some some positives even aside from just the scoring with with three assists, three steals. Um, and I thought, you know, again, especially after Summer League, where it just felt like, man, he was just out of gas. Um, this is obviously an important preseason for him as he's, you know, as we were talking, he's probably the guy that is is on the outside of the rotation looking in. And so, you know, it's it's an important preseason for him to kind of make his case. And then I think, you know, Mamu, because um, we were obviously, you know, we've seen him in Summer League, but... Uh, but I think we're, we're all very curious to see just what does he look like as, as the competition ramps up. And, um, you know, uh, Grizzlies played, obviously, a lot of their kind of regular rotation guys. I mean, John Morant played 24 minutes. Desmond Bain played 30 minutes. Stephen Adams and, and Jaron Jackson played extended minutes. I mean, Jaron Jackson played 33 minutes. He obviously didn't play much last year. So it's not like you were playing, you know, the the summer league B team of, of the Memphis Grizzlies tonight. So a good chance for, for Mamu to get some run. And I thought he also acquitted himself well and just generally I thought looked, looked pretty good. So I, I, out of those three, first off, anybody else that, that you think is, is really worth calling out. Um, and I'm just assume if not, then kind of where would you want to start there? Who jumped out to you? Yeah, I, I don't think we really need to. I mean, we saw Yorgos get some minutes as well. Th- there wasn't really much to speak about. Thanasis, yeah. we know what Thanasis is going to do. He had one really... It was the most Thanasis sort of passage of play because I would say for Thanasis, he's going to get minutes through the season in stretches. Like I would expect that that's going to be the case. But I think he just needs to keep it simple. He had that that brilliant block off the backboard, really athletic play, typical type of stuff that we see from Thanasis. And then he followed it up in the transition play after that block and tried to like throw the ball like over his head. It was just, it was, it was unbelievable. So yeah, just, just keep it simple, Thanasis. But we know what to expect from him. Same with Pat Connor. And as you said, there's probably no point getting into Brook Lopez. The one thing I would say, the fact that he played 20 minutes in three quarters, I don't know whether he would have played in the fourth quarter, but Bud did say pregame that, yeah, we'll, we'll keep his minutes down. We'll manage him. He would have ended up about where he, where his average is during the regular season. And part of that was just the bodies they had, I guess. I would I would like to hope that even if they have injuries moving forward here, that he doesn't play every preseason game, though. That seems uh, a little bit unnecessary. But I, I want to start with Grayson Allen. Um, but we did mention that the players were eating barbecue straight after the game. And perhaps at this point in time, a couple of hours after the end of the third quarter, which was the end of the game, they might be starting to sweat a little bit. They might have the meat sweats up, which would make sense. Uh, but I've got a solution for them because Sweat Block is a sponsor of this podcast. And we're talking about sweat, sweat Block Wipes, which are currently the number one ranked antiperspirant on Amazon. So, you know, I mean, that's that's pretty impressive stuff. There's a dry shirt guarantee. If Sweat Block doesn't help keep you dry, you can get your money back. We know there's few things in life that just aren't fun to talk about. One of them is excessive sweating. You know, when you're sweating through your shirts for no reason, it is embarrassing. So if you or someone you love is dealing with this, you have to check out Sweat Block. Get it today for 20% off at sweatblock.com. Use the promo code Locked On, or you can get it at Amazon and CVS as well. And uh, I always have a lot of people 
not a lot of people. I don't want to don't, don't want to exaggerate here, but I, I get people DM me before games and they're like, hey, tell us how many minutes this guy's playing. Is this, what's the rotation going to be tonight? And it's always these fantasy people trying to work out what their fantasy teams are going to do. But the people at Sleeper have realized that fantasy basketball is broken. Games have been won, based on, uh, won and lost based on whose players had more scheduled games this week. It made no sense and required very little strategy. So in 2020, Sleeper released a brand new way of playing fantasy basketball. It's called Game Pick, and it's only available on Sleeper. In Game Pick, owners pick a single game per week for each starter to count towards their team's total score, ensuring an even number of games played between opponents. So if you're someone like me that can't be bothered checking your fantasy team every day, changing the lineups every day, you just want to do it once for the week, set your lineup, and you're going to be feeling good. You can do that in Game Pick, and you won't have to worry about how many games each player is playing per week. It's just simple. It's just it's really made it simple. Sleepers crack the fantasy basketball code. If you play fantasy football, if you prefer building out a weekly strategy versus daily busy work, you're going to love game picks. Download the Sleeper app and start a league with your friends today. Uh, you will not be disappointed. Uh, so as I mentioned, as we get into it, we're going to talk about Grayson Allen a little bit here. I said it off the top, but we thank you guys for making Lockdown Bucks your first listen of every a day it's free wherever you get your podcasts and now on youtube as well i'm going to keep hassling you guys about the subscribers but we're 650 plus we want to get to a thousand as soon as possible that's our that's our aim here we're trying to get to a thousand subscribers so grayson allen i think i think we both have him projected to be in the starting lineup with dante divincenzo out we understand that dante divincenzo and grayson allen potentially heading Uh, for restricted free agency. And we've spoke about the fact that there's probably going to be a little bit of a battle for minutes there. We think they'll both be in the rotation, but there's certainly potentially a starting role that's up for grabs. I thought Grayson Allen tonight displayed a few aspects of his offensive game that we would love to see from Dante. And that's finishing around the basket. Uh, He had a nice little Euro step to floater. And it got me to look up his numbers on cleaning the glass. And and this is just interesting. So in 2020, Grayson Allen was 66% on shots at the rim last season he was 64 percent on shots at the rim so you know not a bad percentage there for a guy playing at the two guard spot and just for comparison Dante Divincenzo was at 54 percent last year and we've spoken about it that would be an area of his game you'd, you'd like to see him tighten up a little bit but I, I thought uh, Grace Allen impressed me really stuff off the dribble like I know he's going to hit a hit a three and he was three for six on the night but he, the way that he was able to score in other areas stood out to me I thought again as you pointed to against a, a pretty good overall defensive team, but B, a, a team that had most of their uh, frontline starters on the floor. Yeah, and I think one caveat worth mentioning about the, the finishing numbers, Dante, I think about a quarter of his shots come at the rim versus Grayson. Um, I think it was like 13% last year. Mm-hmm. So Dante definitely getting a higher volume of shots at the rim. Naturally, if you're creating more looks, odds are you won't shoot as high a percentage. Um, but I, it was kind of funny. I think I, I can't remember Kane, if it was one of our discussions or with, with some other people was talking, but it's like Dante's kind of like, you know, his, his legs and his athleticism, right. Checks that his like small hands and short arms can't cash. Like he can, he can kind of get towards the basket, but then he just, again, doesn't have that kind of control. doesn't have that, um, this, you know, I don't want to say discipline, but doesn't really have that ability to finish consistently out the rim. You know, his legs kind of splay all over the place. And, and again, I, I do think, you know, he, he's clearly doesn't have, you know, big hands. It's not like he's like easily palming the ball around the basket. His, you know, he doesn't have a, a, a big wingspan that he can rely on to kind of help him finish um, over defenders. So um, I, I thought it was interesting that, you know, Grayson Allen among his baskets, his, his, couple of two pointers that he hit you know one of them was a pretty nifty reverse layup and another one was kind of a driving little kind of euro into a a short floater move which again he just you know not that he's gonna always hit those shots but just generally look pretty under control and then i think for the three pointers you know two of his three threes came off of pull up threes off brook Mm -hmm. lopez screens so two of those coming you know sort of basically self-created threes and, and overall out of his five baskets tonight four of them you know you could call it self-created it's not like he was just sitting in the corner you know waiting for an open shot and, and just knocking out an open shot so certainly you know if if that's something that he can do with consistency that you know he's not just a guy that that's feeding off of you know standstill jump shots when other guys create open looks for him 
obviously that that speaks to him having a little bit more dynamism, him being able to play with more bench units. Um, I'm not going to say he's like going to carry bench units and, oh, just rest Chris, you know, Drew and Giannis because you don't need him because Grayson Allen's going to go and drive, you know, the engine of your offense. Definitely not that. Uh, but, you know, that's something that Dante has shown he can do too, right? I mean, you know, sometimes he's a guy that, um, like, you know, early in possessions, he'll take a screen or just pull up from 26 feet and jack a three. And a lot of them are, are kind of like, no, 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 yes type type yeah. shots that, you can actually make those, and I, it's kind of interesting because when when he misses, and, and especially when you're losing, it's like oh, wasted possession, right? But he also, I mean, he had a lot of those last year where you know, if, especially if you're you're losing, you're trying to get back in the game. I mean, you can hit a quick three. Obviously, those are big, right? To to be able to kind of splice, you know, slice in the lead. So, um, so Dante's obviously made progress there as well, and so it, it's just really interesting because there are so many similarities between the two guys. I think. I think Dante is a more dynamic sort of defensive playmaker than Grayson is, but, you know, in many other ways, um, you know, I think they both uh, can be pretty good passers. Um, they're both obviously very similarly sized. They're both, you know, white guys with 40 plus in vertical leaps who can do things athletically and occasionally, you know, dunk um, in ways that, that maybe, you know, jump off the page a bit, especially for guys their size. Um, and I think Grayson certainly is more polished and has a better pedigree as a shooter. Um, but Dante obviously also made strides last year. And, you know, to, to the point that I was saying earlier, I mean, again, Dante is not just a standstill, you know, sit in the corner and, and shoot open jump shots type of three point shooter. Um, you know, he, he definitely shoots some thumpers, uh, when he's pulling up from really deep, but, um, uh, you know, he doesn't take all just super easy threes and, you know, the percentage last year getting up to 37% or so, obviously I think was, you know, testament to, to how much he's, he's grown in that regard. So yeah, I think that's going to be interesting. Um, you know, again, you hope that Grayson Allen can continue to make the most of the opportunity here. Game one, you know, check the box. I thought, um, I think defensively, you know, we'll, we'll see kind of how he blends in. I think physically he can compete reasonably well. I think, you know, is he as good as Dante? Probably I, I wouldn't expect them to be. We'll, we'll see. I, I can't say I, I have seen him enough to really kind of make a really detailed comparison, but I certainly feel a lot better about him um, defending, especially once you get to, you know, the postseason and teams can hunt poor defenders. I certainly like his odds of, of surviving on defense more than Bryn Forbes, right? And and that's sort of the thing, right? I think you can look at it two ways. You can look at him as, as sort of the Dante replacement here in the short term um, while Dante is injured. Uh, but then I think, you know, once Dante's healthy, effectively he's also a Bryn Forbes replacement and and you know if you're wondering well where are the minutes um I think certainly he slots into those Bryn Forbes minutes or or Dante slots into the Bryn Forbes minutes if if uh Grayson continues to start and similarly you know the DJ Augustine Jeff Teague minutes those become George Hill minutes assuming all those guys kind of stay healthy so that, that's you know a big reason why I feel pretty good about you know the the Bucks backcourt depth and and what they've done there because I think um, those moves, I think those guys are just better. And I think also, you know, they're just more versatile, especially defensively. Yeah. I like the word, uh, polish that you use. I think that makes sense offensively. He does, he does feel like he's, he's perhaps, um, you know, I guess more in control offensively. Sometimes when we talk about Dante, we, we are impressed that he can get to the spots where, where he's, if he can really clean that up, you know, he should be able to take a step offensively. I think one of the difficult things to, to really look at is we saw Grayson Allen and it happened against the Bucks. He had a huge game. He had 26 points, 27 points. And he had lots of games like that with Memphis last year where he really put it on. He shot the ball well, scored in a variety of ways. Is he going to have the opportunity to do that with this Milwaukee team? Probably not. And we've seen Dante become a consistent double-digit scorer, but he never really gets to 25-30 because the opportunities just aren't really there. I mean, that's the nature of playing on a contending team. So that'll be interesting. Uh, you mentioned Dante in regards to no, no, yes shots. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if Jordan War is going to be a guy that's always going to fit into that category. There was one today during the broadcast where he dribbled through the legs three times, I think, and then just jacked up a three. And it was right in the middle of Marcus Johnson talking about how confident he is as a shooter. He hit nothing but glass. And uh, they all sort of just had a laugh about it. And then the next uh, play up the four, I believe, he dribbled to a mid-range, knocked it down. That's Jordan Wara. I think it's noteworthy that you mentioned that he had three assists. So I looked this up after the game at his game log from last year. Uh, he only had assists in four of his 30 appearances last season. And, and 
the last game of the season, he had 23 shots without an assist, which brought me to thinking about what his per 36 numbers look like. Now, we know he's played a lot of games where he's been in garbage time, but last year per 36, uh, Jordan Wara was uh, four field goal attempts. He was second on the team per 36 with 17.8 shots per 36. Only Giannis was ahead of him. Uh, He was shooting at a higher rate than Middleton and Drew Holiday. So he gets his shots up. And again, he's been in situations where that's totally fine to do so. But I think we've heard language from Bud over the last couple of media conferences when he spoke about Jordan Wara that he's kind of hinted at the fact that he wants to see different aspects of Jordan Wara's game. And one play stood out to me. I think everyone that watched the game will remember it. Uh, There was a ball under the basket, went out to the corner, ball swing to the wing, another ball swing to Jordan Wara. He pump faked, could have easily taken a long two. We've seen him take that shot a number of times. Then he fired the ball under the basket to Thanasis for, for the dunk. And, and honestly, like I don't think that that should be overlooked for a play that he's made because that's just not the pass that we've seen him make over the last 12 months. So you know, those are the little the types of things that will stand out and will at least help his cause if he's trying to get into the rotation because he has to move the ball a little bit more, particularly if he's going to be a guy that's going to actually fit in and play with the other stars because we haven't really seen him do that. Yeah, and I've got I've got a barking puppy in the background, so if people I actually if people can't hear, hear it. it. So. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I thought I think game one of 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 Vegas, we saw him. It was probably the most playmaking we've seen him mm-hmm. do. Period. Yeah, right, and, and that was yeah, where he was you know running a lot of pick and roll and and actually showing some ability to to hit guys you know roll men out of those situations. Um, you know, I don't necessarily expect a whole lot of that in the regular season, but yeah, I mean, a lot of it's just move the ball because I think some of his instincts are as more, he has some ball stopping instincts, right? Because he's a guy who likes to, I think, get a feel for the ball before he puts it up. He's not a guy that, you know, is just a pure like rhythm catch and shoot guy. He, you know, I think we've talked about a fair bit. He shot the ball better off the bounce last year than, uh, than he did off the catch. And just as a a catch and shoot guy, which um, is, is a good sign in some ways, but it's also, you know, from a, how do you kind of develop into being a complimentary guy with better players around you there? It can be a little more problematic. And that's why, you know, as far as his comps go, you know, I, 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 I don't know who, who I heard the, the Nick, the Nick young comp um, from, (laughs) but I think there's something to that. Right. I mean, you know, Nick young has been kind of a little bit of like a meme, but um, you know, he was a pretty good volume scoring kind of bench guy. Kind of, again, you know, like can, give you give you kind of instant offense type of player not necessarily always the most efficient um not necessarily the most well-rounded type of player uh but you know had value at an nba level i mean that's an nba player right i mean certainly if if jordan war became nick young that certainly would be more than what he is right now which is a guy that is obviously trying to carve out a role on an nba team granted it's the defending champs so it's not like you know he's he's not able to play on you know some team full of young guys um in a similar spot to him but but yeah I, I think you know for him it's just two things just playing within the team concept and figuring out how he finds that balance between looking for a shot which he has to do right i mean if he's not shooting and scoring what's the point right um i, I like him attacking i like him taking a screen and going downhill um, he's a guy I'm, I'm fine shooting kind of those little push shots, floaters, because mm-hmm. I think he's got a real feel for that. You know I mean? Some guys just, some guys are just scorers and they can just do that, that kind of stuff like that. You know, I don't think Jordan war is, you know, the kind of guy who had to, um, really bend over backwards, try to build that skill set. not to say he didn't have to work at it, but you know, he's just a natural scorer in a lot of ways. Um, so I, I kind of like that again, kind of, kind of speaking a little bit also to, to somebody like Grayson Allen, you know, not just playing with other guys, but when you can have a little bit of that pick and roll game, um, you know, it makes you, I think also more versatile because it does mean that, you know, you can go in with the bench unit and, um, and maybe, maybe with one other star and yeah, you can take a pick and roll and, and go get a bucket for your team. So, um, so I thought, you know, some encouraging time there and, you know, he was, had a bunch of steals today, you know, was disruptive. Um, you know, that can be a double-edged sword. You know, we saw that game last year in Sacramento where he actually was playing um, some rotation minutes. I think that was the, Kings game where Giannis was out and I think Bobby Portis may have been out of that game too. So he kind of had a, had a shot to play. So almost by default and that was a game the Bucks ultimately kind of hung on drew hit a bunch of big shots. Um, but I think Jordan had a three in that game, but then he 
gambled on um, on defense, and I remember seeing Bud just like chew him out, going to a timeout, <laughs> and you know th- that's obviously just kind of one of these things. You know, I think you watch him play; he obviously has has weaknesses, sort of as a as a man defender. Um, but I, I think I think with young guys, you know, we always you always kind of look at you know look first to see kind of how they do in individual defense just because that's when you're really paying attention to them the hard part is really evaluating them as team defenders but i think that's obviously kind of the the underrated piece and in many ways the hard part for a lot of these guys um and so again i'm not going to sit here and tell you that he's like made some huge (laughs) breakthrough as a team defender um but you know i think the whatever he had like three steals tonight um you know a lot of those words as kind of picking more opportune times to, to come over and help and um, and, you know, not do it in a disruptive way where you put your team at a disadvantage. And again, you know, the, the, the challenge now is just kind of continuing to build off that. And again, he's got an uphill battle just to get minutes. But, um, you know, between rest, we saw him obviously get a lot of opportunities that way last year, or, or at least not a lot, but but some opportunities that way. Um, and, you know, especially the way the preseason started, we'll see with injuries and resting this year. I'm, I'm, you know, knock on wood, you hope it's more the Bucks choosing to rest guys than, than injuries, but, um, but we'll see, you know, anything can happen, especially with a short off season. Yeah. And I, I thought you made a good point about the, him needing to come out and shoot and score. So sometimes we look at it with guys like Dante and Jordan Wara that, oh man, I don't know if I would have liked him to take that shot or maybe that's a shot you want to put away, but I think you're right to a point. If you're going to be playing with these guys, like to have two young players that are that are confident enough to just let it fly, I think is is a really positive attribute. Particularly if it pans out and they become uh, real rotation players. And he's not the same type of player. I know you mentioned Nick Young, but think about some of the guys that have been really, really positive contributors to good teams because of their ability to shoot and score really quickly. Guys like Jordan Clarkson, uh, Lou Williams, these types of players. Again, not they're not the same player, but the same type of role uh, coming off the bench. I want to talk about. Sandro uh, Mamu Kalashvili here in a, in a second here, and particularly one part of his game. But with betonline.ag, they are back and better than ever. All eyes are on the gridiron as teams are back for another football season. As always, Bet Online is your number one spot for all the pro and college football action this season. With a new updated site and interface, even more odds, props, and contests. Bet Online continues to be the number one source for everything football. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Don't forget to use our promo code Locked On to receive your bonus. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet Online, where the game starts. So Mamu Kalashvili, Frank, I thought out of the three guys that we wanted to see at Summer League with Diakite and Jordan War, he was the most impressive, and you can decide how where the bar was during summer league. It wasn't, wasn't the most uh, impressive summer league performance as we come used to from the Bucks. But one thing that stood out to me with his game and we've identified the passing, which I think is really impressive for a guy his size. But again tonight, and we saw it throughout the entire summer league, he's got a real nose for the ball on the glass. And seven rebounds tonight, five of them came on the offensive on the offensive uh, glass. And we... This was something that the Bucs really identified last year that they wanted to do more of. They wanted to hit the offensive glass. We've seen it come up big in the postseason. Second chance points were a major factor. And just having a big that's really active on the glass, good hands, able to actually secure the rebounds, it's it's often an overlooked skill in, in the modern NBA, I feel like, rebounding because we see a lot of the guards that come in and they'll rack up the rebounding numbers. But it, it has stood out to me. I mean, this is a guy that doesn't look completely out of place uh, on an NBA floor, whether that was summer league or tonight. I thought, again, he was he was pretty solid. And I think from what we know about these injuries, he's going to get an opportunity to play some some real minutes in the preseason. Yeah, I mean, I, I, when I'm watching like the preseason, right, and you're trying to get a gauge of, of some of these young guys, some of these marginal roster guys, I feel like I, feel like I always sort of end up bucketing guys in three broad categories. And again, individual game like guys have good games games things break their way or they don't you know you, you never know um but i think there are the guys who are like, like clearly you know like wow that guy's like really popping when you watch mm-hmm. him right and then there are guys that are look the part like guys that look like hey that this guy looks like he's an nba player and then there are guys just like yeah i don't know that you know if you took random 
middle of the roster summer league dude and put him in that guy's spot that you could really tell yeah. the difference right i mean like to like you know yorgos like uh, he obviously i mean he didn't really do much and just generally didn't really look like he was was ready for for an nba game um it's his first one so whatever but again he's a 60th overall pick um the odds are always sort of stacked against finding an nba player uh, at, at that point but you could say the same thing for a guy picked at number 54 um and i i would you know kind of agree i i, I was pretty cautiously optimistic about sandro coming out of vegas um not in the sense that he was, I mean, it was, it was interesting because he was obviously a guy that at Seton Hall was a number one option, um, you know, had the ball in his hands all the time. And I thought the, the, the part that was encouraging about Vegas and what I also saw tonight was he's not, he's not playing like a guy who's trying to figure out, wait, how do I contribute now that I'm not the best player on my team? Right. It seems like he's, very quickly grasped, all right, you know, last year he played 36 minutes a game. He grabbed two offensive rebounds per game at Seton Hall. Well, were they asking him to stand around and then crash the boards? No, they were putting the ball in his hands. I mean, he was in a different role. His numbers don't look like a guy that, you know, would, would be a great offensive rebounder, but we'll see, right? I thought, you know, he showed flashes of, of being a pretty good rebounder. I, I thought his hands looked pretty good in Vegas. Um, you know, I think he's pretty quick to the ball and you know, he just, just seems like a guy who like generally knows how to play. And mm-hmm. and I think that doesn't really guarantee him anything in terms of, of his NBA future. Um, but I think it gives him a chance. And um, I think he's a guy that, uh, you know, his shooting, he had a couple threes like late in Vegas after missing like everything, his first few games. Um, he, he does not look like he has any ability to shoot off movement. You know, his, his three point shot usually misses him short. Um, and so I, I don't really, I mean, that's one of those things I don't, I don't really see him necessarily developing into a, a consistent three point shooter. Maybe he can be kind of a keep you honest type three, three point shooter. Um, but just again, like the activity level, um, a willingness to compete, you know, he had that possession where, where he was, um, they were playing a little smaller. He was having to defend Steven Adams. He was trying to front Steven Adams and they throw try to throw it off the top and he deflected it out of bounds. Not, you know, look, literally not a, not a play that will show up in the box score, but those are, you know, and I, I hesitate to even say like winning plays, but those are the plays you have to make to try yeah. to, you know, scrap and, and win minutes at some point in the NBA when you're a guy like him. So, um, so we'll see. I mean, I, I, I he's a guy I want to see a lot of here in the preseason. I think the, the upside of, you know, Giannis and Bobby getting maybe more rest than we'd want is that we do get more of an extended preview of of kind of how Mamu Kalashvili can can fit in, um, and and yeah, I mean I don't think he'll ever score a lot of points, um, but you know the activity level and you know I thought, thought we saw it a few times in Vegas. He did it again tonight. Like you know he's got he's got a, a very good handle for a guy his size, obviously, and when he gets ahead of steam, kind of going downhill, um, he can be a pretty good finisher. He's, I don't I would not call him like an explosive finisher. Um, but he, he gets going downhill and he's pretty quick and, um, he, it's sort of interesting it, in all the games. I think we've seen him playing for the Bucks, Vegas, and now this preseason game, he looks more competent. He looks more comfortable finishing with his right hand than his left, mm-hmm. even though he's nominally a lefty. So, I mean, we have obviously a history of those guys, you know, Drew Holiday is, is a reverse guy. who's a righty who generally likes to finish around the basket with his left. You know, there's John Henson, who obviously was sort of that yes. fake righty, right? <laughs> um, there's obviously been been plenty of these guys sort of throughout NBA history that for whatever reason um, seem to, you know, not really kind of uh, seem to use their off their quote unquote offhand uh, a lot more than their dominant hand. So I, I'm kind of curious to see what what uh, you know if that sort of becomes a, a recurring theme. But but I mean, hey, if if you've got you know two hands uh, as a big that you're comfortable using, um, great you know that's just one more kind of thing in your in your toolbox that that can you know give you that that little marginal edge and and maybe helps you helps you be a little bit better offensive player and and yeah just you know be a good passer be active on the glass um doesn't mean he's like standing under the rim all the time but just being quick to the ball you know when even if he's you know 15 feet away just beating other guys to the ball um i thought it was a an encouraging you know kind of performance from him and i you know the, the best thing i can say about his defense is i haven't really 
mm. noticed him standing <laughs> out. I, you know, I thought that was my big concern was that he was just going to be a really poor defender. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't say he's, I mean, he could definitely get stronger, but um, especially if he's like playing the four or he's playing with another larger, large ish guy uh, on the floor. Um, I think he can ha- hang in pretty well and he's pretty mobile. Um, so, so yeah, I thought, you know, a, a solid first, first night for, for him and kind of continuing the theme of what we saw from him in Vegas. To your point about the college scoring and the fact he was the first option, I, I never actually specifically thought, thought about that, but when I do now, it's kind of funny because there's definitely times in summer league and one or two occasions watching this preseason game where I was like, come on, Sandro, you, you, you don't need to pass everything. You don't need to be sprinting around, setting all those screens, like the score a little bit. Let's see if you can score. So it's kind of like he's been almost uh, too unselfish. It's felt like at times, which is actually pretty impressive uh, for him. As we wrap this up before we do, I'll mention my Aussie mate, Josh Lloyd over on the Locked On NBA Fantasy Basketball podcast. For those of you that are playing fantasy basketball, uh, he's doing drafts and you can keep up uh, with everything he's doing. He'll help you out with his league. It is the number one fantasy show, uh, fantasy podcast in the world. That's a that's a fact right there. That guy that, that guy has a big audience. So go check out Josh at the Locked On Fantasy Basketball podcast. Uh, last point for me, Frank, and I know you won't probably I, – I don't know. I know you you watched the replay. You were driving when the game was on live. Uh, you went back and watched it. So I don't know if you caught the the debut of Lisa Byington. But I want to say that that was a big positive from tonight as well. As someone that's in Australia and is going to be watching these broadcasts rather than being in the arena, I look, we know Marcus is a pro's pro, the best in the business, but – I thought the chemistry was good and they had to deal with the fire alarm and a stoppage at the end of the game. And I thought they were fantastic. I know you were listening to Eric and Gabe on the radio as well. I caught them in the pregame. I'm biased, so I can, I can say that I enjoyed the pregame show. But shout out to Lisa. I thought she was awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I had to watch the TNT version, which, um, I mean, TNT had Kevin Harlan and Sam Van Gundy. So, that, that's, hey, by the way, by the way, it's bad luck to Eric. His first uh, radio broadcast, he's going head to head with Kevin Harlan. But hey, I mean, what, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, 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 Kevin is right up there. I would say alongside, you know, Breen and and Ian Eagle might be my favorite. I would maybe go Eagle one, um, Harlan two, and uh, and Breen three. But those are guys who are all really good. And um, yeah, I, I was. I, I was really happy to see Sam Van Gundy um, back with TNT and and to see him uh, as a color guy in games. I think is 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 uh, is a good thing. So so I I watched that, which um, was was good as well. But looking forward, obviously, to catching uh, the new Bally Sports. I didn't call it FS Wisconsin. Uh, the the Bally Sports broadcast with uh, Marcus, Lisa, and uh, and Zora. So excited for that. Um, and uh, and yeah, it was really fun. I was driving back from Houston with my my family the, to this evening, and uh, you know it was like, well, this works out. I get to listen to <laughs> to Eric and Gabe, and um, and uh, it was funny. Yeah, I mean, you know, just uh, it was just really cool to to hear to hear Eric uh, on the radio. I mean, I I I I don't know Gabe really well. We follow each other on Twitter, um, but I mean, he he clearly is like a pro at at doing play by play. I thought, you know, I was like. I didn't, I didn't really know what, what his background was, but yeah, Gabe was great. And, um, you know, Eric was, you could tell as the game went on, Eric really kind of got a sense of kind of the rhythm, which we were talking before the game. It's like doing a podcast versus being a color commentator mm-hmm. on the radio for the NBA is like night. It's like complete polar opposites. Cause you have three or four seconds max <laughs> to make a point yeah. when you're doing radio color. Um, because the play by play guy has to be talking all the time. So, you, you know, someone like me, I could never do that because I take <laughs> five minutes to say anything, you know? Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's just a totally different pacing and rhythm. Even T, you know, we've talked about the sort of difference TV versus, um, mm. versus radio as well. Um, that it, that's also really different, especially probably for the, you know, the, the play by play guys just have to be way more active on radio just because obviously they're, you know, they're telling the story of, of what's happening on the floor and the color color commentators, you know, you got to in and out real quick, right? Um, so so it's fun, but I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to have to try to figure out for the next game um, if I can, you know, simulcast it or whatever, yeah. uh, try and get it get it synced up so that I can listen to, to, uh, to Gabe and Eric again. 
but uh but yeah they got to uh they got to have to eat some innings there um after the third quarter when uh when the fire drills started to go off yeah, I feel like he would have really slipped into his comfort zones here in that uh, during that off period. He's probably more used to that. But you're right. I mean, it's not like on TV where you can listen to Marcus Johnson tell old stories and, and ramble on for a couple of possessions that keeps us all so entertained. You don't get the opportunity to do that on radio. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll catch them as well. But again, Lisa, I thought was awesome on the TV broadcast as well. So we've got a couple of nights off before the Bucks get back into it. Tomorrow on the show, we're going to be talking... Uh, I don't know if you caught the GM survey, Frank, but we're going to go through some of the answers there. Um, some interesting talking points from that. And Thursday, I don't know if you're free, Frank, but Eric is scheduled to come on the show. So we'll be able to ask him uh, what he thought about that. We're going to catch up with Eric before the season starts and find out if he's going to... Is, is he balancing radio and writing and everything else that he does as well? I don't know how he's going to have time to do that, but we'll catch up with Eric then. So for now... Uh, I, don't, I don't think he's that busy. I don't think Eric's that busy. I mean, he... Trying to talk I mean, him up we, here, Frank. Yeah, I mean, we, he's whatever. He's watching he's basketball. He's a, you guys are like, you know, single dudes. Well, I don't know if you're single, but you're... I am. You I know, am just uh, unmarried. Bro, bro, you're, unmarried <laughs> you're, you're unmarried dudes without kids. And I mean, do you do you even have a pet, Kane? You, you don't have a pet right now, right? Yeah, your nothing. dog is at your parent's house, right? So, I mean, what do you... You have no responsibilities. Yeah, yeah I mean, pff, write and, you know, podcast and call some games on the radio. Come on. Like, don't don't tell me that's hard. Yeah, well, the one other thing we've learned from this podcast sounds like Dudley's going off. And as we know, all Dudleys know how to talk. So we better wrap it up. Uh, it's, it's midnight and he needs to go out one last time before uh, before bed. Got to keep those puppies, uh, you know, from from having any accidents. He just needs accidents. to take a leak. He just needs yeah. to take a leak. Go look after the dog, Frank. I'll catch you next time. For everyone, appreciate you listening as always. And we'll catch you guys tomorrow.